Hello. Oh, hi. Let's see if this works. I haven't been live in a while. My name is Kasha. This is my channel, Creative Pecky Bings. And this is the very first time I'm using the YouTube uh, streaming app. So hopefully this will work just fine. Let me just super quick go to my channel and double check that the stream is working. I'm already seeing some comments. We have Sheila from Life with Pets. We have ZD. We have KG Cichlids. Hello, everyone. This is like the most random uh, live stream. Oh, oh, there we go. Gotta mute it. There we go. Awesome. So everybody is popping into the chat. We're starting to have more and more people show up. I really, really appreciate it. Today, um, I was going to do a update on my betta fish, and recently one of my female bettas passed away, which kind of made me think that I should once again kind of go over the topic of why betta fish more commonly die because. Over time, I've been kind of getting obsessed with this, and like I have so many notes everywhere. I have notebooks where I'm like writing everything down. I've got some research papers I printed out. It, it, it's been a thing. So I'm hoping that um, in my quest to try to figure out and reduce the amounts of better deaths and try to make sure that my betas live the longest possible lives that they can, because I'm so obsessively researching this, these are some goodies of information that definitely will help you guys. So that way I can pass it along. I will be checking in on the chat every now and then, but I do also want to kind of jump into the topic because um, it's, it's it's kind of, it's a lot, it's a lot. And I'm a little unorganized, but we're gonna try to make this make sense. Let me kind of pop in over here and take a look at everyone. We've got Jess Shrimp Granny, hello. We've got um, Chewy LTD in here, Eva Loves Earth. Tommy Vincent is here. Um, oh yeah, and Tommy, I'm gonna have to add you as my, I wonder if I can do it on here. Can I do it? Add you again as a moderator. Oh, there you go. Yay, since I'm doing it on desktop, I can finally do it. So that's awesome. We've got mobile gaming DKR. So I appreciate all the mods on here that are helping out. Do, do, do. So, Let's kind of jump into the topic. Um, for starters, let me kind of explain what happened. So my female koi betta unfortunately passed away due to a freak accident, which from perusing a lot of Facebook forms, I noticed that if this happens once in a while to people, it's not super common, but it's one of those things that just sometimes happens and you can't really prevent it. And unfortunately, she choked on a blood worm. Usually when bettas eat blood worms, especially if you give them roughly the appropriate size, they should have no problem eating them. I feed a lot of my fish as much uh, frozen or live food as possible. And in this case, the blood worms are frozen. And they're actually, uh, I think they were the Hikari brand, which might have been the slightly smaller ones because I have a lot of the betta maha chai, which are up here, which do prefer the smaller ones because they're on the smaller side. But once in a while, you get a betta that tends to get a little too greedy and will try to gobble up too much at the same time. And in this case, I don't know exactly how she ate them. I just knew she, when I came back, she was at the bottom of the tank no longer breathing, breathing, and there were still like blood worms kind of sticking out. So she seems to have grabbed a bunch and unfortunately choked herself to death, which possibly can happen to fish. And I guess... It was better to explain this here where we talk about the topic of uh, deaths rather than the beta update very video where I would, will introduce you to the new beta fish I recently got. And I have a couple other topics on here that I've experienced personally, but also have not experienced, but have found in my research that I hope will help you out. Um, one of the things that I've previously experienced is fatty liver disease. I know that this is something that is um, known in the beta community in terms of like breeders and people that have been in the hobby for a long time are aware of what it is. But I noticed that in the like more pet community or pet keepers, this is something that not a lot of people know about. And I feel like this is a bigger issue than we realize. And fatty liver disease occurs when uh, betta fish, when you usually it, it happens um, if you feed them different dry foods that are missing the full chain of amino acids, if all of the amino acids are not present in the food, what happens is the fish cannot utilize the food for, for example, um, 
building muscles and tissues. Instead, it automatically will store it as fat. And fish, unlike, for example, certain mammals, aren't really meant to um, hold on to a lot of fat. Like a little, a small reserve is okay, but usually they can't handle it very well. So what it does is it kind of builds around the liver, which is why it's called the fatty liver disease. And then over time, what happens is the liver can't function properly and this would leave cause uh, dropsy. One of the ways you can prevent this is probably if you can stick to feeding more frozen or live foods because usually these foods are already, you know, they're, they're natural foods that these fish would eat. So they have everything. If you are feeding uh, pellets or flakes, one solution is to at the very least try to mix two different brands. By doing so, you have a higher probability that you will complete the uh, full chain of amino acids. You can also try to find better quality foods. Um, from what I'm aware, of, uh, one good example is bug bites, but I try to mix a couple of varieties. So I started out with mixing two. At this point, I have a mix for my betas that has four different kinds of uh, beta pellets. And I still predominantly will feed frozen, but I do know that some of you guys, you know, only have maybe like one or two pet bettas. You're not going to buy a ton of frozen food to feed your one betta because it'll be a lot harder to keep that fresh for a very long time. So it is much more practical that, you know, you have to feed flake or pellet food. So try your best to uh, mix it up. If you have, if you buy a larger batch, what you can do is mix uh, the small, some of it in a smaller container and store the rest in the fridge. So that way it will stay fresh a lot longer. So the larger quantity of food while you are using the smaller little mixture to feed your fish and then you can, you know, replace it later on. So that is one of the things that um, I'm hoping this will spread around the hobby so we, we can become more aware because I do notice that um, dropsy is very common in bettas, especially I've noticed in Facebook groups, you see it a lot. And I do I don't believe that better liver is the main reason. I feel it's one of the the reasons because fish can get dropsy for for a variety of reasons. Um, and I think fatty liver is definitely a culprit. It definitely happened to me. I was feeding uh, my bettas, especially my baby bettas for my first spawn. I was feeding them too much high fat foods as well. So in this case, they were getting the full uh, lineup of amino acids, but the that fat content was too high because I was really excited about um, power growing my first spawn and I saw how quickly other breeders have grown their fish and I wanted to you know catch up because there's you know there's this feeling like if you if you fry are really tiny while everyone's fried the same age are really big you kind of feel like maybe I'm doing something wrong so in that case unfortunately I was feeding them food that were too high in fats it is possible to overfeed your betta and to also feed them, I would say too often or foods that are too high in fat and fish can get fat because of that. That's another thing you don't talk, talk about. I know that when it comes to breeding fish, you do want to fatten your fish up for breeding. That is the purpose of conditioning because for example, for a female betta, a lot of that energy will then be used up to produce the eggs. For the male, since he'll be guarding the nest for three days and not eating, that reserve, the little tiny reserve of fat that he will have will, you know, get used during that time. But after that, if you would continue to feed your fish as much as you would do, for example, as you would for conditioning, I do believe it will negatively over time affect your fish. I know some breeders will say that you can totally feed them a lot all the time, like especially if it's frozen foods. And the more I've been learning about diets of betta fish, the more I'm a little skeptical. I feel like it's a little early for me to like say that it's definitive. So certain things like that, I'll, I have to put a disclaimer that is um, a theory based on like the information that I've been looking at. And then some stuff I, that I have, will be mentioning will have like science papers backing it up. So I'm gonna take a break for a second, take some water. Oh, I'm gonna check the comments for a little bit. Um, as I've been kind of rambling about this, I have been kind of seeing the comments scroll on the side and I'm seeing a lot of uh, 
my YouTuber friends and everybody is interacting in the chat and answering questions, especially if you have questions and you're worried I might be missing out because I'm kind of talking about this. Uh, Sheila from Life with Pets is definitely a good person to kind of tag and ask her because she is very well versed and does spend a lot of time researching about bettas. So she's definitely awesome with, with her information. Uh, let me scroll here. So we're talking about, oh, we got Infinity Aquatics here. We've got L Flower One Stars. Um, just pointing out some people. Uh, like with, yeah, Sheila says, I mix three different palettes, but do predominantly be frozen. Yeah, that's that's what I like. am kind of leaning towards. Uh, Joseph is here, JH Aquatics. Hello. Man, we're hearing a lot of people pop in. This is completely random. I was not expecting to do a live stream. Well, I guess once in a blue moon, it's kind of fun. Oh, Eva says, uh, conspiracy theory. I don't know if it would be necessarily a conspiracy theory. I, it would be more about just, you know, theories of kind of what I've been trying to put together to kind of figure out the mysteries of why we are more likely to lose bettas when we keep them. And I definitely try to take every loss of my fish very seriously and I try to figure things out. So I'm kind of going to be moving down my list. I have a little list right here. So after talking about the fat, fatty liver disease, one thing that you can't control to a certain degree is genetics. Now, of course, it depends where you get your fish from. If you get your fish from a reputable breeder, breeder that um, breeds for health and looks as well and also holds back some fish to make sure that they don't have health issues down the line, I think you have a better chance of getting healthier bettas. If you are getting pet store or imported bettas, then it's kind of like the lottery. You can get lucky and you can, of course, get very healthy fish when you either get a pet store fish or a imported fish, but you can also get really unlucky and, and get a fish that genetically, like everything is going against you and you can do everything perfect, as perfect as you can in terms of better care and that fish will you know, either waste away or have a shorter lifespan. I, um, a few months back, had the privilege of actually speaking to a breeder overseas that owns two farms. Uh, he has one of the bigger farms that uh, exports the fish to the common pet stores, and then a smaller farm where he's focusing more on breeding, like, really well, good quality fish. And he told me, you know, in the big farms, it's volume, volume, volume. We have all these stores and not only PetSmart Petco's, but like a lot of pet stores and, and importers. There's such a huge demand for fish and it's so hard to keep up that they literally throw random fish together that like look nice and they're just breeding fish just massively. So no one's really paying attention to genetics. And that, you know, results in either sometimes you get really healthy fish because you get lucky and sometimes you just have fish that have really bad problems and they shouldn't be bred. In my personal experience, the line that I originally started with, which was two Petco fish, um, have had some issues, which is why I actually stopped uh, working on that line. Because what I did is I held back a few while I sold the rest. And this allowed me to kind of observe the fish and see what kind of what happens over time. One of the things that I noticed is that was um, my black and white like pandacoys were developing these um, the fish acne on their chin, which was a big problem. And I noticed that it occurred in uh, different generations. So that was a problem. Um, another issue that I had was, well, the fatty liver disease was not genetic. That was a problem in, in how I raised my fish. But another issue that I had is um, longevity. So my spawn um, did not last very long in terms of like the full two to five years. Um, right now, the only like remaining fish that I have from my breeding is the female Aunt Anna, which is the um, koi, she's the cellophane, but she carries the koi gene. She's the only one left. So at this point, I knew that it was better to kind of abandon that line instead of trying to fix it. And now I'm on the quest of finding a good quality pair. I've been uh, talking to some breeders and um, 
just kind of figuring out where I can acquire fish, where to a certain extent, I can at least know their background a little bit. Um, there are some amazing breeders out there that really, like, they take not only the form of the fish very seriously, but they do care about genetics. Um, one thing that you can be on the lookout is um, usually feathered tails and roast tails are big no-nos for um, good breeders because while they produce really beautiful looking fins, um, the, the reason why they occur is due to a specific mutation. And of course, the different fin engine colorations in betas are in fact due to mutations. Some mutations can really badly affect the fish. So the, um, the rose tail and the feather tail betas usually have uh, what's called an X vector gene. And this not only creates the beautiful uh, kind of, I can't describe the, the feather tail and rose tail finish, but it's got like the split kind of feathery looking rays, but it also causes a lot of internal issues such as bent spines and just problems with internal organs. Uh, you also see um, scales that are kind of like, instead of going in a nice smooth pattern, they're kind of random. And in general, these fish, when you, when you breed them, not only is it hard to breed the X factor gene out, but also these spawns, out of a large spawn, only a handful of fish are okay enough to be sold and the rest is all culled. So usually if you have, if you're breeding fish and you're culling a vast majority of your fish due to health issues, that's, you know, an indicator that there's really something wrong with, with the genetics of the fish. So, um, some, some people are, are not aware of it, but I just, I kind of see it as kind of like a red flag. So if you see feather tails and roll cells, I feel like those should be, you should stay away from those because, you know, genetically we, we push domesticated species quite far oftentimes, but I feel like feather, feather tails and roast tails are pushing it too far. And now, uh, you know, I think it was like last year, there was another version that was called an Apache feather tail, which is even further. And I'm just like, no. No, don't do it. Don't, just stop. Stop pushing it because clearly there, there's so many issues with those types of finish. So um, definitely try try your best to to go for the the tail types that are more likely to be healthy. There are um, there are articles out there. If you go to, for example, Beta Territory which is a um, website made by an, like, an amazing, amazing um, breeder. He talks about rose tails and feather tails and like why if those ever pop up in his line, those are automatic calls. Like that is a big no-no. He keeps that out of his fish because he wants to produce healthy fish. So unfortunately, you know, there's only so much we can do, but we can try to become better informed consumers by asking questions. So whenever, you know, we're, we're purchasing fish, you know, unless it's from a pet store where, you know, you can't, you gotta play that like lucky lottery. If you are purchasing from a breeder or importing, try to ask some questions about, you know, how the fish are raised. Um, are they mass bred or, or is that like a line someone's been working on? It's, it's good to know. So genetics aside, now we're gonna go on to the next topic, which is also a common one, and that is an adequate temperature can actually cause a premature death of a beta for a variety of reasons. The really obvious one would be, uh, obviously if your uh, heater malfunctions and it gets too hot, um, eventually it will be too hot and your fish will quote unquote, I, you know, they, I, we call it cooking, but it's not really cooking, but they will die due to the, high heat. Now, bettas, uh, betta splendens, they tolerate high heat pretty well, I, maybe a little less than wild, but they were designed to tolerate high heats because uh, the wild type betta splendens, um, in, in the little shallow volumes of water that they live in, the water, there is no water movement. It is very low oxygen content, and that is why they have the labyrinth organ. So as water gets hotter, the oxygen content of the water becomes lower. So to compensate for it, they have to use that organ to breathe at the top. So even though the like agreed nice temperature would be about 78 degrees, it can go up to, I would say 80, 
90 something is like pushing it and you kind of don't want it to go like i mean 100 is like danger zone you never wanted to get that far ideally you know you want to keep it i would say roughly between the 78 and 80 that's like a little happy zone for them because not only does the water um, temperature affect the oxygen levels it also affects your fish's metabolism so if you keep fish uh, bettas in higher temperatures what's going to happen is because their metabolism is a lot faster there are theories and right now we're going into theory land again that it will shorten their lifespan so they will grow faster they'll develop faster and i have seen this with fry excuse me if, if you keep frying higher temperatures um i found like a good number would be like 84 the fry did grow faster they would hatch faster they would develop a lot faster so there is a theory going on and i don't really know if there's anything like concrete to back it up but there have been some people that have been mentioning that once your betta becomes a bit older and mature it might be even better to drop the temperature a little bit so like i would say 77 76 no later because they're saying that as they're older this would um help slow down their metabolism the downside is where i'm kind of skeptical is if the temperature is kind of too low, I worry that bettas will have a hard time digesting certain foods because it does affect their digestion. On the other side, it would technically make them less aggressive because um, water temperature does affect aggression as well. This is like an old school thing that a lot of cichlid keepers, and I have some cichlids back here. I have a Placidochromus jello and a random uh, electric yellow back here. With African cichlids, what you do is if you're keeping a group of cichlids and you're having aggression problems, one thing you can do is drop the tank temperature by one degree and all of a sudden that will lower the aggression down a little bit because the fish's metabolism will slow down. I kind of wonder if that would affect um, the temperament of a betta that would be say in a community tank with other peaceful fish. I don't think it would make bettas okay with other bettas, so don't go off and be like, oh, you know, I'm just gonna lower the temperature and put two males together. No, we're, we're just like in theory land. Ideally, I would just say, if you take anything from this, try to stick to around 78 degrees Fahrenheit and try to keep the temperature consistent. Large fluctuations are really bad for a fish's health. Um, I don't have a study with me, but there was an actual study done on, on, I don't remember if it was bettas particularly, but it was done on fish. And they compared fish where in the tanks they had very stable temperature due to tanks that were fluctuating. And the ones with fluctuating over time, this wasn't like a fast thing that like doesn't happen tomorrow, but over time it led to shorter lifespans. So fish like consistency. The only reason why I was a little hesitant about um, how important it should be to stick to that 78 degrees is that the betta mahachai the wild type bettas that i have i've been keeping them a little cooler I've been, they've been doing really well um i don't think i've ever had them go lower than 76 though but they've been kind of doing well in that temperature and you know i still keep a lot of young ones together and the aggression has been very low but also mahachai obviously Less aggressive than the splendid so that's you know something I'm, I'm, I'm kind of wondering about but definitely just try to keep your temperature consistent and that will help improve your betta's longevity um let's see infinity aquatics on here says hey guys remember to be respectful yes please um while you know i'm kind of rambling about um all this information over here and you guys are having your conversations in the chat and asking other YouTubers and awesome beta experts questions. I really appreciate it if we keep this like a really positive and respectable and safe space because a lot of people in here, we have a mix of people. We have people that have been keeping fish for a long time and we also have a younger audience and I want this to be like a really safe place for everyone to ask questions, have discussions. Um, I'll probably be re-watching this later and reading through the comments. So if there's any comments in particular or questions that you have, um, I will be reading through this later on. So in a future video, I can kind of address this if um, none of the awesome other people, other YouTubers and awesome mods that we have, um, if they're not already addressing these questions. 
The reason being is I kind of don't want to get too distracted by the chat and kind of stay on topic so I can cover as much as I can without this being too long. Um, right now we're at 25 minutes. We've got 71 people here. We've got 37 thumbs up. I appreciate all the thumbs up. I appreciate all your engagement. Everybody here just kind of hanging out. Uh, just want to let you know if you haven't subscribed yet, please do. If you're, if you're new here and hanging out, I will be putting out videos twice a week, every week. I'm kind of getting back into it. So awesome stuff. Let's kind of get back to topic. So, so we've already talked about uh, fatty liver disease. We've talked about, talked about genetics. We've talked about inadequate temperature. And another thing that is a common reason why beta fish don't live their full lives is water quality. And I actually broke this up into two parts. The water quality in your tank and the water quality of your tap water. Um, the water quality in your tank, you can maintain yourself uh, to a certain extent. For example, you know, making sure you stay on top of water changes, making sure your tank is cycled, making sure you're not overstocking your tank. The part that you can't control too much is the type of water that you get locally. So based on wherever you are, whether it's you know within the United States or other countries, you're obviously going to have different parameters for your water. I recently have been kind of doing some tests because we've been trying to figure out what's going on with my shrimp tank. So I was doing some um, water tests. I need to do some more, but this is actually, I should show it to you. So this is kind of my little shrimp tank. And then we were doing some RO water tests as well. So my tap water, is 7.3 right but my gh and kh is pretty high my gh is 10 and my kh is 5 so that affects the hardness of my water so even though out of the tap my water is you know kind of neutral 7.3 like that sounds like a pretty nice like beta ph right over time as the oxygen um because water is very oxygenated when it's like flowing around through the pipes and it comes into your home, after, and, and a lot high oxygen content does actually um, lower your pH. So as the oxygen exits out of the water, I did notice because of the KH and GH, my pH actually goes up. So my shrimp tank, for example, there are no additives in the orange shrimp tank. There is no wood, there's no tannins. So this is like just, you know, Plants, shrimp, and some rocks and gravel, that's it. And my pH actually goes up to 8.3. And I need to check the pH on all the other tanks. So I need to go through all the tests. But in theory, I'm already assuming that the pH on most of the tanks that I don't add wood and tannins and other things that will help um, lower the pH, my pH is a bit higher. And how that affects my fish is, first of all, that us tend to do better in more acidic water that is lower pH. But also, um, the amount of bacteria and how bacteria and diseases attack fish actually is different based on if you have hard or soft water, which is why, for example, cichlids who prefer hard water are known to be more hardy because they're more disease resistant because there is actually a much higher bacteria count in harder water, while in softer water, which has a lot of tannins, you know, has a lower pH, the bacteria count is actually lower. And there was a study on this, I'm like so excited about this kind of stuff, because I'm a little fish geek. They uh, did a test where they had, um, and this is, I, I'll show you the, the, the study, so you can look it up, you can pause it and try to find it yourself and kind of read the article. But they had, uh, what kind of fish did they use in here? Uh, catfish. So they tried this on catfish. And they tried this with columinaris, which is, you know, type of fish disease. Um, and what they did is they had catfish in hard water and catfish in soft water. They did a test on how much bacteria was present on the gills of the catfish. And they found out that the um, hard water uh, cat, uh, catfish had 800,000 bacteria attached to their gills of the columinaris strain, while the soft water ones only had 440. That's it. That's a really big difference. 
and they're saying it's a thousand nine hundred times higher. So when you have betta fish who are used to softer, more acidic water, and they're used to being in water that has a lot of tannins and a lot of natural materials. For example, there's a lot of clays in the water, and clay. There's a specific type of clay actually. I had it written down somewhere here that is actually known to help uh, fight columinaris and other diseases. It is actually called kaolin, which is a type of clay. So when you have fish that originally come from an area that um, the amount of bacteria, because the water is more acidic and due to all the tannins, um, come into the United States or the countries where the water is a lot harder, you're going to have fish that are going to be struggling and having a much of a harder time dealing with diseases because as the fish gets shipped over or get imported, or even if you buy a fish locally and it still gets shipped, there is going to be some stress. Whenever there's stress, a fish's immune system it becomes compromised and it is much more likely that they can get sick. So based on where you live, it might not even be ideal to keep certain types of fish. I do notice that a lot of salt water, not salt water, soft water, there we go, I'm getting tired. Soft water species do have a harder time, which is why, um, I don't know if some of you guys noticed, I've been kind of moving more towards um, cichlids, that are, you know, from Lake Tanganyika and Malawi because my water is more ideal for them. And then for my bettas, I've been starting to move more towards adding additives to, I don't want to mess with my pH too much and I don't want to mess with my water too much, but I'm trying to add things that will help my, make my fish more disease resistant. I did notice that tannins, just adding them into the water from using Indian almond leaves, you can buy extracts as well really help. I've had fish that had, you know, get really sick. And once I put them in heavy tannin filled water, they would improve over time and they have a much easier time improving. And then fish that I jarred in tannin water did so much better than the ones that were without. So there is clearly a big distinction. And the, based on where you are, where is your location, it will affect your fish. Um, another thing that you can't control is agricultural runoff. So if you're on well water, a lot of people talk about well water being the best for fish because you don't have to worry about, you know, the additives of chlorine and chloramines, which are, you know, very toxic to fish. The downside is depending on where your well water is, you can um, have problems where you have um, agricultural runoff and you have certain chemicals that will be in your water that can kill your fish. If you're in the city, you, another problem that you can't control and it can kill your fish as well is higher concentrations of chlorine and chloramine. When there is a lot of flooding, a lot of rains, or any sort of health issues, sometimes the city will increase the amounts of chlorine or chloramine that they put in your water. Um, I'm starting to see more and more fish keepers buy aquarium like chlorine pool kits, and it's becoming a habit to sort of like check your water every now and then to see what's going on. Because let's just say you do a water change every week and you dose the same amount of like water conditioner. Um, I use the, the Fritz water conditioners. I used to use Prime before, I used to use Safe. Whatever it is, usually people are used to dosing the same amount, right? But let's just say maybe there was some big rain um, in your area and there was some flooding and the city decided to put more chlorine in your water just to make everything safe because maybe there was some contamination going on and they doubled the chlorine amount they don't have to tell you that they did the amount of let's just say if you did like one cap of prime that might not be enough anymore to cover the double dose to neutralize it so then the the chlorinator is covering half of the dose but you still have the leftover chlorine and that's affecting your fish so that can um that could definitely injure your fish or cause death depending on how much it is and it's one of those things you can't control sometimes you get like freak accidents that happen but it's some of those things that like just talking about it is important because it spreads you know the information um i really hope that more people spread this kind of stuff because i feel like I wish I knew all this stuff and like I'm digging it out slowly, slowly and it's helping me and I'm hoping that this, this kind of stuff will help you along the way too and together we can do better and making sure that our fish are alive longer, they're healthier, they're living better lives. Okay, more water. Oh my gosh, I'm going on a 
awesome rant, but I'm really happy to be sharing this stuff with you. Uh, Jess is doing an amazing job. So is Sheila and Infinity Aquatics. Thank you guys so much. Just all the mods, if I'm missing anyone, thank you so much for answering questions and helping out and just in general moderating because this is like fun to be able to talk about this, but also kind of pop in. Um, yeah, Chewy LTD said, yes, Chicago waters are quite hard from what I remember. Yep, and, and it's really weird because when I started out, I never, I mean, I did until recently, I never tested my pH and GH because it's something like I never thought about testing. I always would just test for pH. So I'd be like, oh, you know, I'm pretty neutral water, 7.3, like sometimes I'd get seven. I'm like, this is great for betas. And I didn't realize that over time it changes in your aquarium as, as the water interacts with all the little different factors, it, your pH can change. Um, and also that means that, let's just say hypothetically, if my pH is like, you know, let's say the beta tank is 8.3, but my tap water is 7.3, uh, then that's a really huge jump of pH that is happening every time I'm doing a water change. So in that case, um, which is why I'm, I'm gonna be testing my beta tanks as well as all my other tanks next, what I would have to do to kind of combat that would be either to age my water. So like pour, pour some water in a bucket and just kind of like let it sit overnight, which is what I would do for my baby bettas. And this would help kind of make the pH more similar to what would be in the tank or do smaller, more frequent water changes. Um, one of the things that people do when it comes to shrimp as they'll drip water in with a little dripper into the shrimp tank, that makes sure that there's a, Difference in pH, it's it's a lot slower, so it doesn't affect the shrimp, which are more sensitive. I feel like with bettas, we should be a little more mindful of, of our water parameters because just because bettas, bettas are um, advertised as really hardy and they've been known to survive pretty poor water conditions. Overall, I actually don't think they are hardy at all. They, they do die very easily. They get sick very easily and we should pay attention to what is happening to our water and kind of work with it. You know, it's something if you have really hard water, you can ask yourself, you know, is it a good idea for me to keep getting bettas or maybe should I try to get a different species? Or if I want to keep bettas, what can I do to kind of make this a better environment for them or to prevent spikes in pH? Um, it's all questions we should be asking ourselves and it'll make us better fish keepers because we're all kind of figuring these things out. So um, let's, See, uh, another thing, oh, I completely forgot when I was talking about diet, another thing uh, that can happen to betta fish and unfortunately happens more pretty much with um, dry foods is bettas do tend to get constipated very easily. Um, bettas in general, they're, first of all, let's talk about their diet. Um, they are kind of like, um, yeah, carnivorous type of fish. Um, they would eat, and I have it written down here. Bugs, slugs, snails, aquatic in in invertebrates, tiny fish, like little tiny baby fish, and zooplankton in the wild. So that's what a betta splendens in the wild would consume. So roughly, we want to kind of like mimic that diet. So we want to try to feed them small worms or insects, arma, daphnia, you know, little crustaceans. But when it comes to dry foods, Dry foods not only are, are obviously dry when they're eating them, so they're going to expand inside of their bodies, but they also, excuse me, have certain fillers that kind of keep the food together and fall, keep it from falling apart that might not be as easy to digest for the fish. So a couple things you can do to kind of help prevent that. One thing you can do is soak your pellets obviously with soaking you have to be a little careful because if you soak them too long they will sort of kind of fall apart and it will kind of really dirty up your water but that's one thing you can do another solution would be to space out your feedings so let's just say uh, hypothetically you feed your fish a few pellets twice a day I would take the same amount of pellets that you're feeding as a whole, and if you can, maybe split it up to three times a day. So that way it's a smaller amount more often. So there's a little less in their stomach. Now, bettas can handle a lot of food when it comes to frozen and live foods. If you notice when people do condition bettas for breeding, like you'll see females and males like pig out 
on, on worms it's, or babies that are growing up. Like, they all have their stomachs and they look like they're going to explode. And then the next day, they like just poop it all out and they're back to their normal size. So with that, you know, it's a little, you can go a little more ham and not worry as much, but with pellets, I'm always careful not to overfeed. So whenever I do feed flag or pellet, those would be the days I am feeding more lightly. And for some reason, like I'm going to be going on vacation. So maybe my fish aren't going to eat for a few days, or if I'm preparing a fish for shipping and I want to kind of make sure that the fish is strong and ready to you know, not eat for a few days while it's being shipped, then I will usually predominantly rely on frozen or live foods because I, I feel more comfortable um, feeding those. And even that, you're not 100% safe because as you, you know, as if you go back to the beginning of the live stream when I mentioned that my female got 3D and she ate too much bloodworms. So with any of the things I'm, I'm mentioning today, you have to keep in mind that sometimes... <sighs> It's based on luck. You just sometimes you can do everything right and things can go wrong or you can do everything wrong and somehow you better still survive and it's alive. So in the end, when you try to, you know, keep your fish, you do your best, but try not to get too hard on yourself. If, if things out of your control happen or if accidents happen, um, I'm definitely guilty of this. I do tend to be very self-critical of myself and I, I overanalyze, I research, I take notes and I'm always like, anytime I lose a fish, I get really mad at myself. Like, what did I do wrong? How do I fix it? But I know like down the line, that's not a really healthy way of thinking. It's good to acknowledge what's happened. Obviously feel sad because it's your pet and you obviously, if you value it because it's alive and it should matter. It's a live little creature. But at the same time, you know, you have to just, there's just stuff out of your control sometimes and you just kind of have to let it go. So there, there's that piece of that rant. Um, more water, more water break. We're at 42 minutes. I think roughly in like 10 minutes, um, I will probably stop because I feel like I've covered a lot of the topics. We talked about diet. Uh, we talked about the bloating. Um, there is, when it comes to bloating, I did um, read, not read, but I did listen to a podcast from a veterinarian. Before I forget to drink my water, drink my water. And she said that, oh, one thing that, that we don't talk about a lot of the time is vetas are prone to these things called salamic cysts and tumors, which are secondary to microbacterial infections. So when microbacteria infect them, they will get these cysts. And what happens is they actually look bloated. And that is due to the bacterial infection. There is no treatment or cure available. And it is a zootonic disease, which means that it can be transmitted to humans. So sometimes when you see bloated fish, that could also be why. It does not necessarily have to be because of food. It could actually be a bacterial problem. And in that case, um, overall, whenever you have fish, just always be careful because there are a few types of diseases that can be transmitted to humans. There's not that many, but, there, but they do exist. So whenever you handle um, dead fish, I would really recommend, you know, never like using your hand to pick it up or touch it. I would recommend, you know, using a net to sterilize it, the water change, just, just be very you know careful and you know in the case of the salamic cysts and tumors that a fish can get that's bloated that's one of those things that unless you took your fish to the vet you might not even know that happened to your fish so you might be thinking you know my fish is so bloated you know maybe it's a female and maybe i think she's egg bound or maybe it's a male and maybe you could be thinking oh i overfed my fish and you could feel so bad well, when in reality, this could have been like a you know bacterial infection with no cure, and there's nothing you can do about it. It's not your fault. So this is this kind of circles back to the fact that there are certain things out of your control. But I thought it was really important to mention this. I almost forgot because you know we have to be careful um, in this case since it is something that can be transferred. But it could be another reason why your fish uh, can die. Um, let's see what else. I'm kind of just at this point looking over. The notes to see if I forgot anything. Um, there are um, 
stress can be a problem when it comes to death. Definitely um, rips and tears can cause secondary um, like issues such as infections, uh, which is less common, but bettas do have a tendency to squeeze themselves into things, get their fins ripped, or if they will bite their fins obsessively, eventually they could get infected. One of the things that I've been kind of thinking about is the half moon male that I've had for a while that has a really bad fin biting problem. No matter where I put him, he just fin bites all the time. I have been considering setting up a tank just for himself because if he's by himself, it will be a lot easier for me to keep the tank itself kind of as clean and you don't want it entirely sterile. Obviously you're going to have like good beneficial bacteria, but I, I, you know, like I can make it a little easier for him not to get infected, whether if he's, you know, in a tank where it's a divided share tank and it's more high risk. So that's something that you can kind of um, try to avoid if you have a community tank or if you have a divided tank set up and your fish is destroying uh, its fins, whether on decorations. If, if it's on decorations, obviously you remove the decorations to replace it with something more better safe. Or if the fish is injuring itself, it might be a better choice to isolate that fish in its own tank because of the, the chances of infection are higher. One of the things you can do is keep the fish with, you know, slight salt content mixed with some tannins. Those will usually, you know, lower the bacteria than the, the bad bacteria that would be there and which will kind of keep your fish a little healthier. Um, one of the things that you can look out to try to, for it to be like a first um, indicator that there's something wrong to prevent a death would be lethargy. Um, lethargy, this is a tricky one because bettas are ambush predators. This means that they want to conserve a lot of energy in the wild. Bettas, when they hunt, they will kind of like swim around all the different aquatic plants and they'll kind of look for little critters to go after. And sometimes they'll hide and the plants and just kind of wait for something to get closer and then just ambush. This helps them uh, conserve a lot of energy so, and they also don't like to be exposed in the open because of it. When it comes to our domesticated species because of their longer finage, um, they also try to conserve a lot of energy because it's just tiring to swim with all these extra fins. So in general, meadows tend to be a bit more lethargic because of it, but um, so it's a little tricky to tell, like, is your fish lethargic because it's just tired and it's just, you know, living its life. It's hard to swim. It's hard to be a betta. And naturally they are ambush predators. So they're not like the most active fish by default. Right. Or is it a health issue? One good way to test it is bringing out food. If your fish uh, has a schedule, so your fish, you, you've been feeding your fish for, you know, maybe a few weeks, your fish is aware that, you know, a little container means food or you're coming at a certain time means food and that fish is not getting excited about getting fed or at least making an effort to kind of get up in the, in the feeding spot where it eats and like making the effort. That is usually an indicator that there's something really wrong if, if, if the fish won't get excited by that. And in that case, the first thing you want to check for is water quality and the temperature because this could be lethargy to the temperature or it could be an ammonia spike or a you know nitrate or nitrate spike. It could be a variety of factors. So the last thing, we're on the last thing, guys. We're on the home stretch. Obviously, this doesn't cover all the topics, but this is sort of what I've collected at this point. And in the future, because I'm gonna keep researching this because I'm kind of obsessed with like figuring out how to prevent bad deaths. So in the future, maybe there'll be more information, but the last thing you wanna kind of uh, be on the lookout for is uh, a lot of mucus. If, if a fish is producing a lot of mucus on, on their scales, usually that's an indicator that their immune system is, is like working overtime to try to protect itself. That's a big indicator something's wrong. So you can kind of be on the lookout, and try to do some preventative measures um, and, you know, medicate your fish or start taking a look at their environment. And usually these early signs will help prevent an early death, hopefully, by kind of being proactive and kind of paying attention to what's happening with your fishies. So whew, we did it. We did it, guys. Oh my gosh, I did it right on time because it's about to be 50 minutes. Wow. This is this is a lot of information, but I really think this is useful. Um, I'm gonna take a look at the comments now, just if there's any questions I can really quickly 
I'll answer and then I'll probably kind of end this live stream because this was pretty long, but I think it's good information. I definitely enjoy um, listening to long live streams, especially if people are sharing a lot of good information. I recently been watching Corey from Aquarium Co-op with his live streams because they're just not like a gold mine of information whenever you hear him talk. So I'm definitely not as um, well versed in things as he is, which is why like I can't say things off the top of my head. I have notes, but I'm trying my best to kind of help do my part. So let's take a look at the um, comment to see if anyone's saying anything. Um, people are having some conversations between each other. Um, oh, there we go. Jess says, security pack keeping, how do you feel about bug bites? My betas love them. It's not their only food, but they love the fly lover. I'm actually a big fan. I feel like they're doing, they're, they're going in the right direction because when it comes to, you know, figuring out like, what is your base protein? A lot of the times we go for like easily farmed things. Like you would use like a, a fish based protein or like, for example, like salmon, I think is a very common one for a company to actually use bugs like insects, which is an actual natural diet of, of, of the fish in the wild to be like an, the, the protein source. And these, these flies that they use, the, the black, uh, I think this is black fly larva, are not like that difficult to harvest, you know, and, and breed in large quantities. It makes so much sense. I think that brings fish closer to their natural diet. I kind of wonder if that's why fish like it so much. I feel, I really hope that companies will, I mean, they always improve, but they're gonna push to improve a lot more and produce better, higher quality food for the fish. I definitely think um, us as consumers, we play a big part in this in a sense that we put the pressure on the companies. So by becoming much more well-educated about these topics ourselves, and by kind of talking to companies or re requesting better quality food, you know, it's going to put the pressure. If you noticed in the dog and cat industry, there's been a whole like reform when it comes to food. Like a pet co recently is saying that they're not going to be, I believe they're not going to be um, selling foods with like dyes in them. So oh, there's like cars, hopefully no one's stealing anybody's car out there, but you know, they're already kind of, taking the step to only selling better quality foods. There's the whole like raw feeding um, trend that's been growing and people are becoming more aware. They're becoming more interested in like, what their cats and dogs are eating and you know, what's really in their diet and they're putting the pressure on the companies. I feel like the, I'm going to close my window real quick, guys. Oh my goodness. Somebody's stealing, I hope no one's stealing a car. Ooh. That would that would not be that would not be a good live stream, but I really hope that we're gonna start putting the pressure on the fish keeping industry. Um, we need higher standards. Excuse me. We need to push for more because especially what I've been seeing in the big box stores with the type of things they sell for fish, they're they're behind. They're they're making steps to improve. But we can push them to do better. And, you know, the first step is to educate ourselves. I think education is the most powerful tool, not only for obviously taking better care of your pets, but in general, being a better, well-informed consumer, helping the, the industry as a whole. A lot of the times, you know, my old, my old uh, method of thinking was, you know, just get people, like, angry about it. I remember... I did the video about the myths about bettas and at the end I was like saying sign my petition and I had a whole petition for like pet stores to stop selling bowls and like I got a ton of signatures and it, and it went nowhere. <laughs> like I did all this effort. I got people like so angry about it. I got people riled up and it did nothing. So at this point I've kind of learned that the best thing I can do is try to provide people with information that I take the time to like dig up myself and just to spread around the hobby. And then people can do a lot of great things if they're uh, armed with, um, you know, good information. Kind of like how they say like the pen is mightier than the sword, something like that. that that's kind of what we're hoping with. And that's why that's the whole point. I know this is live stream is a bit long. 
So I'm hoping that, you know, uh, for those of you that might be rewatching this video later on, maybe you're doing water changes, uh, maybe you're folding laundry or doing something. Hopefully you can just listen and hopefully this will help you. That is, ah, that is the best deal in your car. <laughs> oh my gosh. I think, you know, if, if anyone would do it, it would be, it would be the new better I got. We haven't named him yet, but he's, he's, he's trouble. I got him at the IBC show. I was going to make a video uh, today, actually, about introducing him and giving the update on the betas. But because I lost the female koi, I thought I'd talk about this first so we can talk about better deaths and kind of turn this into like a, you know, learn more like an educational opportunity. And I, I, I noticed that I have footage from the IBC show that I went to, which is the International Better Congress, which is a club I'm part of. Uh, of breeders and that, that show their fish and both in the US and um, internationally. They had a show recently here in Chicago for the first time. I volunteered to help out. And while I was at the auction, not only do we like, li I live streamed like half of the auction, which is a lot of fun, but I also filmed a little bit, not a whole lot. And then I thought about it since I got the new white male, the plaid cat, I think he's the traditional, yeah, traditional fin. Placat. Um, because I got him from the ABC, I don't know who bred him or if he was an imported fish. So I don't know his origin, but he was he's a pretty boy, but oh boy, is he the angriest? He's the angriest, he will flare at anything. Like I can be sitting right here. And right now you can't see him because I, I closed the door because the lights are on and it'd be reflecting. But he's in he's in that tank. Right. There, he's in that tank right there. If the lights are on and I look over at him, there's times where he would just look at me and he would just start flaring from across the room. Like, he is that angry. <laughs> he's just the, just the angriest guy. Like, he wants to flare, he wants to fight, like, everybody. So if he, if we had a fish stealing a car, he's the culprit right there. That he would, he would flop his way out the window, he'd steal a car. <laughs> But you know, with with show bettas, show bettas tend to be really spunky because the spunky ones are the ones that do better. Um, he didn't win anything, so he's not like a fancy winner betta, but it was just cool. And so I think the next video I'd like to do is um, kind of edit a little bit of the IBC footage, talk about me getting a I guess show quality betta in terms of like form. He has nicer form. I don't know his genetics. So I don't know if he's like show quality genetic wise, but it's just cool. It's cool. It was a cool experience. So that's a preview for the next video. So either that will be out Friday or next Tuesday. Because maybe maybe I'll have like a cooler idea for this Friday. But I'm back to trying to do two videos a week, guys. It's hard. After this, I actually have to go back to work. I have a lot of work. So that's why another reason why I kind of like live stream. Because work and YouTube and multiple jobs, it's not easy. But we're doing it. So thank you so much. For everyone that kind of hung out, was chatting and hanging out in the comments, thank you to all of the moderators for doing such an amazing job at helping out. I really, really appreciate it, especially because I want this um, this community to be a happy, awesome community. And just, just in general, like, hopefully you guys will kind of benefit from this little bit of information. Maybe one day I'll try to go over this again but maybe in a shorter video. So for those people that can't sit through like a 60 minute video, maybe I can just like cram it down into like quick facts in like five minutes. I don't know, but yep. That's kind of it. Oh my gosh, I just, I shouldn't have. <laughs> like my, my desk is shaking because I just plop my hands down. So it's hot in here. I need to open my window back up. It's nice and toasty and warm. I had a lot of fun. Oh, we also had down the wormhole. I didn't even, ah, I didn't even notice. <laughs> Because I'm trying, I was trying not to get too distracted. But thank you for for coming out. I hope that you guys um, enjoyed this. I hope that this is helpful to you, as it is hopefully you know gonna help make me a better fish keeper. We're all, and hopefully together we can all grow. And you know, hopefully next time I'll be learning from you guys because I, I feel like everyone's learning from everyone, and, and this community is awesome, and we're all helping each other. And yeah. On that note, it is almost 16 minutes. We have like a couple seconds. I don't know. I feel like I want to wait till exactly 16 minutes. Should I do it? Also, I appreciate 
the 70 thumbs up on the video and the 54 people that are hanging out here. We're having a cool, cool group of awesomeness. And yeah, on that note, I'll see you guys at the end of the week in my next video. Bye! End stream. <laughs>